So most of you have heard me speak before. I've got 26 slides in this deck, which at a minute per slide, yeah, you know that's not going to happen. <laughs> so how many people are aware that we've been having problems with the mug server? Okay, so most people, yeah. So uh, it, it's only because I saw an email about it. It's not because I tried to get to the server and it was down. Mm. Good. Somebody who didn't notice. Awesome. Um, so I'm going to cover a little bit of what happened, a little bit of why we think it happened, a whole bunch of what we did about it, and where we're at with it now. Uh, first off, some thanks to a number of OpenZFS developers, um, plus other random Twitter users who chimed in and with useful and not so useful suggestions. Uh, and Jonathan Stewart of less.net who was instrumental to getting us back online in some fashion rapidly and quickly and just sort of eliminating all the red tape and just making it happen. So how this all started. First, some background on the server. The mug server has 12 spinning hard drives, uh, 4 terabytes each, arrays in a ZFS RAID Z2 arrays. This is roughly equivalent to RAID 6. So we can survive two drive failures. And the reason we did that was because it takes longer, it takes so long to rebuild a single 4 terabyte drive in RAID 5 that by the time you finished rebuilding that one drive, you could very well have suffered a second drive failure. Mm -hmm. um, the official, mathematically, you can actually prove that you should be not using RAID 5 for anything greater than one terabyte drives. So we don't. There's also a pair of SSDs in there. That's what the system boots from. That's what runs the root file system, swap, et cetera, et cetera. Everything except the actual bulk storage for the, uh, for the, for the archive. Now, Gilbert was explaining this to somebody at the break. For those of you who don't know, mug.ca is not just a mail server and a little dinky web server that hosts the mug web servers, web pages. It's also one of, one of the main internet mirrors in Canada. So we've got 40 terabytes of disk space online, and that's filled with a variety of general, well, open source, basically, projects from the Linux kernel to a copy of Wikipedia to the Arch mirror to the Ubuntu mirror, the CentOS mirror, Fedora mirror, FreeBSD, OpenBSD, NetBSD, like the list just goes on and on and on and on. Um, it turns out we are the only mirror in Canada for Raspbian. We found that out the hard way when Raspberry Pi users started complaining in droves. Because you were offline. Yep, because uh, we were offline from time to time, for, well, for a great number of times from time to time, um, and it was noticed. Now, those two SSDs also had two ZFS-specific things called the ZIL, or the S-Log, and the L2ARC. So the, the S-Log, or the ZIL, only S-Log is correct in this, in this particular instance, but people use the terms interchangeably anyway. It's basically a write cache. It is not, strictly speaking, a write cache, but think of it as a write cache and close enough. The L2 arc is a hierarchical read cache, so we can only cache so much stuff in RAM. There's only 32 gigs of RAM in the server, so we need an extra device, preferably low latency, high speed, to cache things that we want to still be accessible faster than going back to the 12 spinning drives, but that doesn't, you know, doesn't fit in RAM. We were connected at 20 gigabits per second through less.net. And for the record, another thank you to less.net for providing free bandwidth, rack space, power, access to the facility, you name it, for the last, well, quite a number of years now, I think. Um, and we four or five years, something like that. And there's two one gigabit ports on the server as well as the two 10 gig ports. And one of those is used for out of band management. Um, and then there's a true out of band management port as well that is used for remote console access. So what happened was in a nutshell, the auto updates broke. They'd been broken for a while and nobody noticed. Oh. Yeah, so okay, but no biggie. I log into the server, I notice one day, oh, auto updates are broken. I better run an update. Oh. App get update, no problem. App get upgrade, no problem. 
not expecting any problems. We've done this dozens of times without incident. Except something went on, something happened with the way Debian key decides to keep which kernels on disk and which ones to nuke from orbit and delete. And it erased all trace of the kernel that we had been running up to that moment and left me with the current kernel and current minus one kernel. Broadcom, the vendor of the 10 gig ethernet chip in the server, had somewhere between the kernel we had been running and the new kernel introduced a regression into the driver that runs the chip for our 10 gig interfaces. They no longer work. They now lock up the server hard as soon as you try to use them. Oops. And I have no idea what version of the kernel to go back to to make this thing work again. Oh, double crap. I know. It's time to upgrade Debian in the hopes that a newer kernel will have fixed the problem. However, that sounded like, well, I, the reason I went to the upgrade is I am not hand rolling my own kernel on Debian. They apply hundreds of patches to the kernel, and I don't know which ones are relevant and which ones aren't. And I don't know which ones are relevant to my current build of OS and my current user land, et cetera, and which ones aren't. So screw that. We're just going to upgrade Debian because, well, hey, it's time to upgrade it anyway. That worked. Um, even better was that if you're on the current version of Debian, the very latest and greatest versions of the kernel are available in their backports repo. So again, I don't have to roll my own kernel. I can just use what their kernel maintainers gave me. Um, I couldn't get 5.4 to install, never mind boot and run, due to apt dependency chain problems. Uh, turns out RPM hell is not unique to Red Hat and derivatives. It is also applicable to Debian. So I managed to get 5.3 running by installing a whole whack of stuff from backports, which is not really best practice, but I really wanted the new kernel. So hmm, whatever. But once I got to 5.3, I discovered, well, A, those 10 gig interfaces, they still lock up the server hard when I try to use them. Oh, crew. Eh, shit. Now what do I do? All right, I'll try 5.4. That's the latest thing that Debian developers are working on for this version of Debian. Um, 5.4 didn't, didn't fix it either. This sucked, to put it mildly. And troubleshooting this became a pain in the butt because it's a server, not a laptop. Laptops boot in what? Oh. Like a laptop finishes posting in under 30 seconds now and typically finishes booting in under 60. A server, even a relatively low-end server like this, still took a good seven or eight minutes to reboot each time. Mm -hmm. And the logs, for some reason, somehow, the way it was locking up, none of the log messages were preserved. So all I could do was hope I could hit print screen at the exact right instant using the remote console feature built into the server. This is a crappy way to debug kernel problems in case you were wondering. Also, many, 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 many people have encountered this problem before. And oh, but not to worry, it was solved like 115 kernel revisions ago. Now what? <laughs> so no, no. Um, there is newer firmware, because everybody that had ever reported this type of a problem on a BNX 2X gigabit Ethernet or 10 gig Ethernet chip, the problem is universally load the new firmware. I found the new firmware. Um, but the module hard codes what version of the firmware it loads. And I found some notes that you're not, you're like really, really not supposed to change that and override it because the module and the firmware have to go in lockstep because they actually change the API for the chip. 
and I never thought I would utter the words, the API for the chip. <laughs> now I have. Um, it is actually, if you get the data sheet for the BNX2X, it's insane. The, the application, was it application guide, I think, or whatever they call the reference manual, it's something like 800 pages long for an Ethernet chip. Now, um, the Ethernet chip, as it happens, it crashes, the driver for the Ethernet chip crashes in the LLDP handler, which everywhere else in the known universe is a thing that happens in user space, not in the middle of the damn device driver. We are not happy <laughs> with the fact that the Broadcom chip, just, it just tries to do too much, to be too efficient, and they've overstretched themselves a little bit. This chip does not work reliably. Um, yeah. So the good news is we're on kernel 5.4 now. Yay. Um, and that, that is kind of good news because there's a lot of big improvements performance-wise in 5.4. So, yay. The ZFS modules are, um, well, they work. Sorry. They work. Um, once they're running, they're running. But you get this really scary error message when they load that seems to be completely innocuous. But who knows? So, yeah, we'll be making sure that auto-update isn't broken. What's uh, the message? It's... Uh, Segmentation fault <laughs> in the driver, which then somehow magically continues to load successfully. <laughs> I got nothing. I don't even know how that's possible. Um, so it, like I said, it seems to be harmless, but... Uh, <laughs> Sorry? Could be. It, it, the, the error message is remarkably unclear. If, if I can pull it up later, I will, but I'm not sure if it'll still be in the log. It should still be in the log. So how did you fix the BNX driver issue? We haven't. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'll get there. Yeah. Well, I think that's like the last slide. Um, but while we were looking at the kernel problems, we noticed that despite being connected at 20 gigs, we were only pushing about 200 megabits per second. And I'm looking at that going, okay, wait a minute. Um, I have a 10 gig connection from my VMs all the way to mug.ca. Why am I getting like 200 megabits per second on a good day with a tailwind? Um, something is seriously wrong here. So, yeah, it turns out having a 10 gig connection to your office lets you notice some performance problems that you otherwise would not be aware of. Like if I was on MTS DSL, I would just assume that, well, MTS sucks. Mm -hmm. And that's all there is to it. But no, I'm actually involved with every single step of that 10 gig link to mug.ca, so I know exactly where that path goes, and I know there's no problems there. Why am I only getting 200 megabits per second? Um, yeah, it, it took like half an hour to do a yum upgrade on one of my VMs. And it only downloaded about six RPMs. It was like using a modem. So we did some testing. Um, and I do have to call out some of the other people who work on the server, uh, notably Trevor Cordes, who did a, a lot of the work um, in this time frame. It was not just me. Uh, Wyatt wasn't involved very much in this, but has also taken on a lot of the load over the last couple of years. Um, again, it's not all me. I think you've been done doing more than I have. For well, the last three years? Yeah. Yeah, it was mostly me, and then I was like, your turn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So one of the benchmarks that we noticed um, that was sort of startling was the update DB command would take more than 24 hours to run. And like, okay, so update DB crawls the entire file system. It's never going to be something that finishes in 10 seconds flat, but 24 hours was a bit ridiculous. There was only 24 terabytes of data to index. And a lot of that was enormous DVD-sized ISO files. This should not take more than 24 hours. Yeah. And when we looked at the IO, pardon me, the IO weight numbers, 
It was basically pegged on IO weight. And at the same time, we were seeing the load average crack a thousand on a regular basis. Now, how many people remember the days when a load average of more than the number of serial ports on the server with terminals connected to them was a bad thing? A uh, few of you, okay. <laughs> Um, suffice to say, over a thousand is not an indication of a healthy server at all. It is an indication of an extremely unhealthy server. Um, yeah, the one minute was regularly in excess of 800. Like, cause 1,000 was maybe something we hit every day or two. We hit 800s eh, once an hour or so, which is like, that's crazy. That's insane. This, this is a server that is actually still functioning. How is it still functioning with a load average of 800 or 1,000? Well, and the answer is that all the IO weight was on those 12 ZFS spindles. None of it was on the SSDs, or next to none of it was on the SSDs. Um, our favorite uh, unanticipated consequence was SendMail has a feature where if the load average climbs too high, it basically turns itself off in order to save the server. Because, well, this tells me that Eric Allman is really full of himself, but this, this presupposes an assumption that SendMail is what's responsible for the load average. It usually was. <laughs> <laughs> okay. In the old All days right. it was, yeah, it did get quite a high load. Point That's taken. Um, yeah, and yes, actually, you're, yeah, I guess so. All right. <clears throat> anyway, but we have external monitoring on the server that pings Wyatt and I every time something goes down. So we were getting, sendmail is down on mug.ca. Sendmail is up on mug.ca. Sendmail is down, sendmail is up, sendmail is down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down. Um, as often as like on one day, I think there was about 40 or 50 in the space of an hour or two. Yeah. It literally stops listening. It's not that it gives a connection refused. Yeah. It stops listening. It or actually, it, closed. It, it unbinds itself from port 25, which is, Neat. Uh, I guess this was a good idea at the time. Nowadays, it's kind of a pain in the ass because SendMail was running entirely off the SSDs that were not crippled by IO weight. So it could have just kept chugging along and nobody would have been the wiser. At the same time, Apache was part of that problem. Apache was still running in its classic pre-fork mode which means for every single HTTP connection, there's a process. And for every one of those processes trying to download a file, it's running, it's on the run queue, it's sitting in IO weight state, and it contributes to the kernel's load average numbers, which triggers SendMail to basically lose its mind because, oh my God, the world is ending. Um, so yeah, lots and lots of connections means lots and lots of processes means downright silly load averages. Now. Mod PHP isn't best practice and hasn't been for a large number of years. Um, whether Apache is best practice or not is up for debate. Um, but fact remains, we had actually looked at converting to Nginx, I think, three times already prior to this. And each time we just sort of abandoned it because nobody, well, to be honest, nobody cared enough to actually just plow through and finish it. And in this instance, I figured, well, the server's half dead anyway. How much worse can it get? <laughs> and everybody in this room should know the automatic answer to that question. <laughs> Actually, it, it did not go terribly badly. Um, it took, uh, there was quite a lot of work, more than I would have expected. But nonetheless, the conversion did finally go, I think, successfully. Is there any lingering stuff? Yeah, so we've pretty much 100% converted from Apache and Mod PHP to Nginx and PHP FPM. Under the same exact external load, instead of load averages of 800 to 1,000, we now see load averages of anywhere from 4 to 30 something. That's perfectly reasonable. I can live with those numbers. Um, we also implemented the QoS module in Nginx, very, very trivially implemented it, but one of the problems we had and contributing to all the other problems was some IP address in China would pretty regularly 
open like three or four hundred connections to Apache simultaneously and start sucking down three or four hundred files or segments of files. I'm not sure which it was. Segments of files? So it doesn't really matter. It's like, boom, load average just increased by 400. And it increased because, boom, you now have 400 more processes in IO8 state queued for the large ZFS array to get around to responding to those requests. And it's already got a queue that's like a thousand requests long. It's going to take a while. Um, so we no longer, as far as we can tell, have people hammering the snot out of this server because we're now just saying, no, you get 20 simultaneous connections in a span of, I think it's 20 seconds. And then there's a 10 second grace period so that you can like burst a little bit. And then if you go past that, you just start getting connection refused. And looking at the logs so far, it's fine. Looking at the graphs for throughput so far, it's fine. Looking at the load average, it's fine. <laughs> I mean, load average is not the only story there is on a server, but it's a good proxy metric that sort of sums up how bad the server is behaving in a single number. So it's kind of handy. Um, yeah, we had to do some PHP uplifting because some of the code is written for PHP 3. Um, not a lot, but some. So this was also an interesting exercise. So temporarily, <coughs> to work around the 10 gig interfaces being dead in the water, we rerouted all the traffic through the little uh, out-of-band management firewall. It's a little PFSense box, nothing spectacular. But I was kind of surprised that it could only push about 100 megs per second. Um, well, it turns out it can push well over a gig per second, but not when you're plugged into a 100 megabit Ethernet port. <laughs> so, yeah, that was a oh moment. <laughs> I think I see the problem. And that was the point at which we called Jonathan over at Less.net and said, um, Jonathan, is that really a 100 meg port, or do you just have a gigabit port turned down to 100? He's like, oh, no, that really, that's a 100 meg switch. <laughs> I'm like, okay, sorry, double check here, it's 2020, right? <laughs> but it is less on that. So, um, so I said, well, do you have a gigabit port somewhere that you could give us so that at least we could get around this bottleneck? And sure enough, I was given instructions on what port to plug into within, I don't know, less than five minutes. So I went down and I moved the cable to the gigabit port, which took us completely offline. And then we found out that, oh, right, that port was suspect. Uh, try this one instead. <laughs> <clears throat> so we're now plugged into a gigabit port, which is, uh, and we're not going through the out-of-band firewall, which is good. It was never meant to handle the whole load. So we're still limited to a gig, but, but, um, where is it here? Yeah, so this is what I just said. <laughs> uh, the, the big deal was, um, it turns out that they were getting bombarded with alerts because that port was running at like 99 point something percent utilization 24 seven. <laughs> On a 100 meg port, we were moving like over a terabyte every day, which is impressive. Um, 2.8 terabytes a day, I think, is the, pretty much the theoretical number. Can't remember. Um, yeah, so we're, sorry, backing up there. Uh, so it turns out the gigabit port is not really a bottleneck because we only rarely crack 800 megs anyway. This is somewhat disappointing, but for the time being, I'm willing to take a gig over nothing. So about the same time, one of those SSDs that wasn't the problem, all of a sudden became a problem. Um, and this is all in the like same, what, six week period, roughly? Okay, fine, the SSD needs to be replaced, for crying out loud. And he just needs his cache price? Yes. Yeah, they bring up fast. Yes. 
Um, and I'll get to that too. <laughs> so yeah, one of the reasons that it keeps dying so quickly is, uh, what's the metric called, Trevor? Drive rights, drive rights per day. Entire drive rights per day? Bytes written is also common. So basically, an SSD is rated in terms of how many times you can overwrite the entire thing in a 24 hour period and still have it survive and meet its uh, published specs for lifespan and longevity. Um, when you see how much we were writing to those SSDs, it immediately becomes apparent that we were blowing that number out of the water because we were basically writing to them nonstop 24 seven. They're what they call read, predominantly read only SSDs which is the standard consumer grade SSD. They don't like being written to 24 seven. <laughs> so yeah, we basically burned them out. Now the second SSD is still showing some problems. Well, it, it's, if you've used smart, you, you know, you're probably aware of the fact that it refers to what's called a pre-failure condition. So one of the SSDs was full on into pre-failure mode sending off alarms, emails, alerts, do something, do something, do something. Okay, fine, we replaced you. The other guy is in what I will call the pre-pre-failure <laughs> mode, where one of the pre-failure counters is incrementing very, very, very rapidly, but hasn't actually triggered the pre-failure threshold and triggered the warning yet. We're not actually even sure what this particular metric means but it's there, it's one of the critical ones, and it's going up quickly. So we haven't replaced that one yet, but I have a spare SSD sitting on my desk, ready to go at a moment's notice. Um, now these were already the second or third set of SSDs we'd gone through in this server. In what, five, about five years now? So three, SS, three sets of SSDs in five years. It's not horrible considering how we were abusing them, but it's not great either. I'd rather not have to go down and visit the data center in the middle of the night or on my weekends. So, yeah, <clears throat> the slog, no, it's the S-log. Uh, the the S-log, which is the, the sort of the write cache-ish for ZFS, it's mirrored across the SSDs. So every write to one means a write to the other, 100% of the time, exact same write load. Um, why? One failed and one didn't under the same write load is an interesting question, but that probably has something to do with why the other one is showing counters of concern. Um, yeah, the Intel SSD, some unbelievable number of terabytes to a 256 gig drive. And it was, do you remember what it was, Trevor? It, it was something insane. It was like somewhere, somewhere a little bit shy of half a petabyte onto a 256 gig drive. So do the math, we overwrote that thing way more than once a day. And it turns out that S-Log is an extremely busy partition. Every single write to the ZFS array causes a minimum of one write to each device in the S-Log mirror set. So that's fine, we, we turned off A time, we turned off, um, what's the other variant on A time? I forget what it's called. Sorry? Yeah, the relay time. Thank you. We turned we turned off relay time. We turned off dura time just to eliminate all the gratuitous writes we could. But we're also running half a dozen rsync processes at any given instant on the server, rsyncing remote mirrors and updating our local copy. Uh, and the logs went on to the array as well. Logs on that server were just a wee bit busy. Just a wee bit. So yeah, anyway. And this is where, through conversations on Twitter with OpenZFS developers, I learned that if your data is essentially read-only, why don't you just set sync to disabled instead of standard or always? Because even with, sync equal, even with sync equal disabled, you're still only gonna lose a maximum of five seconds worth of data. Okay, sign me up. And that skips the S-Log device completely. 
So we were able to exchange five seconds of exposure for not murdering our SSDs on a regular basis. <coughs> 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 So, yeah, as I pointed out in the notes there, the array is basically the ZFS equivalent of async mode for EXT4. So, this is now only as reliable as EXT4 if we lose power or the kernel crashes or whatever. Whereas previously it would have been substantially better than EXT4 in terms of resiliency. And one thing worth noting is also that the root drive is still EXT4 XFS. Yeah. So it's not. It's not. Yeah, the it's not EXT4. Not running without C. No, the root root is XFS journaled. Yeah. So, so we don't. Of our critical data. Right? Yep. It's still C. Yep. Um, yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, I'm going to let this slide speak for itself for the most part. Um, it, it seemed like a good idea at the time. <laughs> Well, there's also hardware limits. Like, there's only so many devices we can cram into this server. Splitting them up made sense. And then the L2 arc. This turns out to be a, a, a ZFS peculiarity that's a holdover from the days when ZFS was exclusively about spinning metal, spinning rust. You would have, say, a couple of 15K SAS drives, or SCSI, being the front end, the, the cache, the fast cache for your slow 5400 RPM data drives. So ZFS actually has code built into it and default settings built into it so as to not overwhelm those really fast cache drives right after you reboot. Why not? And the answer is what it does is it, it tries to split the workload so that those cache drives spend about half their time being written to and populating the cache, about half their time being read from, reading from the cache, and the rest of the read requests are actually all served off the main array to try and give you sort of a dual stream, best possible aggregate throughput right after a reboot. Um, in the presence of SSDs, these defaults are stupid. <laughs> so yeah, they had to be adjusted radically. And then zoom. So we eliminated the L2ARC and the S-Log at first. Then ZFS performance basically went and crawled into the toilet and tried to see how far further down it could go from there. Amazingly slow. Oh, it was brutal. It, it was like, like MFM or IDE hard drives on a 386 slow. <laughs> off a 12 drive array. It was horrible. Um, this also taught me that we should have done RAID 60, not RAID 6. We should have split those 12 into at least two, if not three, um, subgroups. Oh well. The things we know now that we didn't know then. Um, so we still need the L2ARC cache though. Like sync equals disabled was great. We got rid of the S log, but this is still painfully slow. We still need a cache. So this is a 1U server. And if you're thinking of the servers that you know, let me remind you, 12 three and a half inch hard drives plus two SSDs in a 1U server case. Not much left. There's no room for anything else to go into this case. Um, except there's one riser card in the PCIe slot. That's it. That's the only spot that's open. What can we do? Oh, PCIe. We can do NVMe. No, no, we can't. The board doesn't support NVMe. Well, actually, it turns out, yes, we can. Uh, the NVMe drive only needs support in the motherboard if you plan to boot off the NVMe drive. Um, this is somewhat reminiscent of when you could only boot off the first 512 megs of a hard drive or the first two gigabytes of a hard drive or whatever, but once your OS was loaded, it could access the rest of the hard drive. Same kind of scenario. As long as you can get to the point where Linux is up and running, you can load the NVMe driver and boom, there's your NVMe device ready to go. So. We got an NVMe drive, a one terabyte drive. Actually, it's 900 and 
960? 960 gigabytes. Close enough. Yep, insert it into the slot, and nothing. This is the point at which I discovered that you had to manually load the kernel module if you didn't actually boot off one. Like, what the hell? And they do not follow the same dev, SD, whatever conventions that everything else does just to, I don't know, screw with you? It's dev NVMe something number, something number, something number. Um, my bet is that a Solaris developer got their hands on this part of the Linux kernel. <laughs> um, and the reason is, in case, just so you know, NVMe devices can, in theory, now they don't all support this, but the spec allows for an NVMe device to be partitioned into several, I can't remember the right term, basically several personalities or namespaces. So it can be, this is to do with virtualization. It can appear as multiple physical devices to multiple physical containers slash VMs slash whatever's running on your host. So if you don't set it all up, you only have one slice, partition, whatever, but you still have to specify that in the device name. This is a pain in the butt. So I partitioned it, I turned it into the L2Arc for the main ZFS array, and yeah, and it went fast. <laughs> Almost fast. 35 different ZFS tunables had to be tweaked. This is... This was not the point at which I loved ZFS the most I ever have out of my life. This would be the point at which I was swearing at the ZFS developers the most in my entire life. Um, and some of them are obvious, and some of them are like, why isn't this the default? Are you actually why? Using ddupe? Sorry? Are you actually using ddupe? No, we're not actually using ddupe. Why is there a ddupe prefetch? Um, because it turns out, if you want prefetch to actually be enabled across the board, you can't have any of the sub things for ddupe disabled, or sub things for prefetch disabled, I mean. Mm -hmm. So, and now that, I can't, I think that was the dedupe one. There was a few in here that I was like, yeah, I better turn this on just in case. Um, and there was a couple where I was like, okay, this is supposed to be the default, yet it's not currently the running value, and I'm not setting it anywhere. What did those Debian buggers do to ZFS? So, there, 35 may have been slight overkill, but it worked. Um, now, in bits per second, that is very, very small print. This spike right there is about, that's reading, that's about 80 something megabytes per second. And that actually does correlate with an 800 megabit-ish spike on the Ethernet side. So, that's... Well, 80 megabytes per second isn't bad, but NVMe is supposed to be like this shit hot technology, man. Mm -hmm. Like, where's my speed? Because the, the average, I don't have 95th percentile showing on here, but if I did, uh, 95th for reads is only, um, I think it, I, I, I looked at the number and it was only about 30 megabytes per second. I'm thinking, okay, I have IDE drives that can do that. This is not special. The top row is writes. That's things filling the cache. Those are, again, not impressive, but at least they're steady. However, then you look at the IOPS numbers. Holy cow! Um, this spike is 4,000 IOPS. Ever try and get 4,000 IOPS off a spinning Rust drive? <laughs> Ever try to get 4,000 IOPS out of an SSD? It doesn't happen. So I rather quickly had to revise my opinion on <laughs> how slow this piece of crap was. <laughs> it's like, oh, okay, no, that's not slow at all. Um, and when you think about it, this makes sense. It's a cache. It's it's only ever going to serve up from cache little tiny fragments of file at a time. 
but it has to do that for every request in the system simultaneously. And the whole point is you want it to be low latency. It's not necessarily so much about being super, super duper fast bandwidth. Mm -hmm. The key thing is that your cache has to be lower latency than the thing it's caching. And a 12 drive RAID Z2 array, when heavily loaded with writes, can have read latencies in the two second range. The NVMe has read latencies in the two microsecond range, I think? <laughs> Micro or milli, I forget. But what like. Your IGOF count again? 4,000. 4,000. Okay. So is that you're that's, sub millisecond? That's, that is sub millisecond? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So. Oh, yeah, right. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so 250 so microseconds, yeah. which is insanely fast. Yeah. So it. We weren't 100% sure what adding this was going to do. We were pretty sure it was going to help. But how exactly? Uh, we're not sure. Let's put it in and we'll see. Well, how it helped is by having that ultra low latency. And that meant that all those requests are getting serviced the instant they come in. They're not waiting up to two seconds for every single block or every single read request from the spinning metal array. So it, it worked. It's actually pretty impressive. All ports, all traffic combined in the end. Um, on this graph, all we can see is a 600 meg spike there. There's other graphs with better resolution where you can actually see an 800 meg spike every now and then. But that's it. So I don't know yet if that's an intrinsic limitation or if it's because of the gigabit port or if it's because of something in ZFS or what? I don't know. However, regardless, 800 megabytes per second, megabyte, megabit. That has to be a megabit because we only got a thousand megabits yeah. to go. Yeah. Um, yeah, so regardless, 800 megabits per second is not that bad. And as long it seems to be able to keep up with the parallel request load. So for the time being, until we have some idea how to fix the kernel device driver problem and go back to the 10 gig ports, this is where it sits and stays for now. So we spent about, for six weeks, we put in, I don't know, between, between everybody involved, probably close to 60 hours of labor. And in the end, all we got was a server that is back online. Um, not quite where we wanted it to be. However, um, I'm going to pause to demonstrate LibreNMS in a second and get to the summary page that I just did verbally. So we're on one, one gig port. We can't use two because one of them is already in use. Um, and we can't move that to the 10 gig port because we've seen what happens when you try to use those ports. And there's no way to put another Ethernet card into the server because there aren't enough slots. Whatever. Um, upside, ZFS got a lot faster. Lots and lots and lots faster. We're no longer murdering our SSDs. Um, we are monitoring stats on the server in way, like almost infinitely greater depth and breadth than we were before. And ultimately, we spent a little bit of money to make this all happen, which was to buy the NVMe drive on sale. Was I think it was on sale, wasn't it? And uh, the adapter card for it. Big what? Um, however, let me show. No, wrong key. mentioned we got an NVMe that has a higher drive price per day hmm. than we're likely that we calculated we're likely to hit. So we shouldn't blow the drive away until the warranty time is this fast. Which is something you should look into if you're gonna have a high drive if you're buying an SSD or NVMe. 
five years, I think, uh, or three. So this is a product that we installed and started relying on, or at least I do, uh, called Libra NMS. It's a fork of another product called Observium, if you ever used that. And let me show you the key thing. I'm not so much worried about monitoring other devices. I just want to monitor myself, so to speak. Bug.ca. It's very graph heavy, which is kind of nice because the human brain can eyeball dozens of graphs and spot anomalies almost instantaneously. That is one thing human brains are very, very, very good at. Now, they have to be fairly big anomalies, but we can spot them pretty darn easy. Computers have a much harder time with that. Oh, also of benefit is the CPU load, the actual CPU usage, went from 90% plus, almost 24-7, down to looks like about 10% on average. So that's a win too. Less power, I guess, if nothing else, less heat. Overall traffic gives me, are those numbers readable at all? Did it seriously just zoom everything but the numbers? Okay. <laughs> it is. But those get scaled too. You're supposed to. Um, so memory, storage, temperature. Yeah, every single drive temperature, every single fan, all the voltage. This is all coming out of SNMPD which has been taught how to extract this information from the system. It's actually quite impressive. Stuff about fans as well? Yeah, fans are in there. No, no, like, that was a change you made as well. Oh, yeah. So there's were having drives overheating. Oh, yes, thank you. Um, that was another, <laughs> I'd forgotten about that. Uh, every time I went to work on the server, I very slightly burned my hands. This was of concern. So we, I flipped the servers, the, the fan speed setting in the BIOS from, and I don't remember what the ASUS BIOS called it. It was something silly, but it was basically, I turned it from, yeah, I'll use the fans when I feel like it, to pedal to the metal. Let's you know, keep those fans spinning at full blast 24 seven. Mm -hmm. And the temperature inside the server dropped by 20 degrees centigrade. I don't burn my hands on it anymore. But now we're murdering our fans. Um, yeah, fans are cheap. <laughs> actually, fans are usually designed to last a fair, fair while at max speed, mm -hmm. especially if they're running at the same constant speed all the time. Yeah. Yeah. It's variable speed that tends to kill fans, and that's actually what we were doing. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, ZFS, so graphs. I love the graphs tab because it implies that this is where all the graphs are. But there's graphs on every single other tab in this, U, in this UI. So really, what are the graphs? Users wow. logged in. Like, Unlike cacti, where you have to go to the tree to see graphs. <laughs> yeah, cacti, um, cacti kind of blows. Is that a client program? Is that, a, is that actually a client program, or is it browser-based? Uh, Server-based. Hmm? Server-based. OK. So it actually runs a polar process every five or 15 minutes on the server, goes and pulls SNMPD, which in turn pulls a variety of other programs, aggregates all the data back into the database. Um, okay. So actually, the graphs are generated on the fly by the server. Okay. Uh, the, the pictures, the pretty pictures we're seeing here, is that being presented by a uh, a client program, or is it from a web browser? Sorry. Chrome. Those are, those are RRD tool graphs. We're in Chrome. Okay, it is web browser. Yeah. Yes. I just zoomed in to get the extra 10% real estate. Um, system IO activity turns out to be one that's actually kind of handy. 
and it's each each graph is last six hours, last twenty four hours, last forty eight hours, last whatever. So it's showing you different time scales by default. Okay, we need to finish soon. Yeah, and well, this is the problem with having more data. Is sometimes you have too much data, and you're looking at the data going. I should figure this out. <laughs> but I don't even know where to start. <laughs> so like, what, what is that massive spike? I don't know, but it happened between, it started at exactly midnight Sunday. Probably a cron job. Which sure sounds like a cron job, but what the, oh! Still think? The new version of a repo. Yes, OpenSUSE. Oh. I think that's what it was. So. Debian 10.3 came out around. Oh, could be. There's um, an apps. One of the nice things about LibreNMS is that if you install plugins and configure your SNMPD to use them, LibreSNMP knows how to make use of those plugins in an intelligent fashion and show you the data in a meaningful way ish. Mm. Um, so for example, smart, I can see the thankfully mostly uninteresting graphs, power on hours, well that's kind of like an uptime graph, it just gradually creeps up, spin retry count, well I hope I never see that on an SSD anyway, there it is, ID number 173, SSD where leveler worst case erase count. If anybody has a hot clue what that means, please let us know. But you can see on the third graph here, whoops. Staircase. Yeah. Um, we're assuming that that's not good. Because this is one of the critical counters that will trigger a pre-failure situation. Nobody knows. And then where leveling count um, is following much the same pattern. Still, we're sitting there going, what does that mean? Nobody knows. Most of these graphs are relatively uninteresting until you get to things like airflow temperature. Okay. Or just plain old temperature. Like, there's... Can I not zoom in? There I can. So if I go back to the last two weeks, airflow temperatures across the various drives have ranged between 34 degrees and 44 de well, 45 degrees Celsius. I'm going to take a wild guess and opine that possibly the bottom three or four on this graph are the ones along the front row. And then the next three or four are the ones in the second row, and then the next three or four are the ones in the third row, and then <laughs> so on and so forth. Um, and you can sort of pick out that pattern in here, but it's not obvious. So we've got, point being is that I did not have to tell Observium that I wanted it to collect and graph this particular piece of data. So if you're using cacti, absolutely, it gives you all the control in the world that you could want. The problem is, is it requires you to take all the control in the world that it could ever want. It does not do anything until you tell it to. This product, open source, free, um, has the intelligence to go out and graph all of the common things that everybody might be potentially interested in. So we, as I said, we've, we've come to whoops, rely on this a bit. Uh, where was, um, no, it's not in here, shoot. Well, it's in here, I just don't remember where it is in here. Performance, by the way, just FYI, does not mean what you think it means. That's the polar performance. How long did it take to gather this information? Why is that called performance at a top level tab? I don't know, that's just silly. But, you know, logs. 
Well, that's our discovery, which we've mostly ignored. Temperature core 2 under threshold, 44. But it's supposed to be 45 or greater. <laughs> Boo-hoo. <laughs> oh, no, we're running our CPUs too cold. I'm assuming there was a logged event when it went above, and now it's just saying it's below the threshold again. Yeah. I don't know. No, no, there should be. Unless it's still under the threshold. Because the previous two were both under threshold. Yeah, yeah. So the logs on this particular instance are not very interesting. But if you use this to monitor your, your entire network, yeah, actually, it's, it's pretty slick. Um, we use Observium, the product from which this is forked at work. And I was familiar enough with it that I was like, yeah, I can install this. It'll help. It'll be a net win. And it was. It was a net win. Um, that's about all I have to say tonight. So why pick Libre MS over Observium? Uh, they're both open source-ish. Uh, Observium gives you, uh, unless, you're pay unless you pay for the subscription, Observium releases new minor revs periodically whenever they feel like it. And that's what you update to. And you update by completely blowing away and overwriting your install. Um, LibreNMS behaves the way Observium does if you have a paid subscription, which is the update consists of going into the directory and typing SVN up, enter. And that's it. Plus these are packages in the distro? Oh, this is no. no. No, LibreNMS is not. This is version repo. Right. <laughs> that's right. It is, literally. Okay, I sort of plowed through that as quick as I could for me. Questions? Do you have any idea when the Bobcom thing will be fixed? Not a clue. All of my inquiries about it have gone into black holes. A situation about which I'm not happy, but I have no real alternatives for. So it's like, now what do I do? I don't know. Well, newer kernel someday should have that new firmware with the packet string. Should yeah, well, 5.6 5 .6 just dropped, which I would hope means that the Debian maintainers will start working on 5.5 for this distro. So, yeah, it's cross my fingers and hope it fixes it. Hope. It's kind of a... They're... Well, they're on board chips. They are board soldered board to the motherboard, board. so. Uh, Sorry? Cases. Inventory. Oops. How did I click a Do you know if there are technology differences in the NVMe drives versus the SSDs that will uh, cause them to have a different lifespan than the SSDs? Um, there are some differences. I don't, I'm not an NVMe expert by any stretch. My understanding is that NVMe drives are basically just highly evolved SSDs with a much, much faster host interface. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's the so same. Flash okay, so so they'll still have a limited lifespan yeah. on, yeah. on the oh yeah. Yeah. yeah on the flash chips, but uh, it sounds like they have a much faster interface. Yeah. Way faster yeah. interface. That's interesting because I thought the limiting factor would be the right speed on the flash. Um, the, it turns oh, it's a combination of things. It's the it's the marshalling of the data, the serialization of the data, into SATA packets the latency inherent in the SATA link itself, the deserialization of the SATA packet in the drive, it goes through the SATA controller in the drive, and then finally to a flash controller in the drive, and then finally to the flash chips. Uh, NVMe eliminates like five intermediate translations and basically just connects the flash chips through a relatively dumb flash controller to the PCIe bus. So the only thing left that the flash controller does is basically LBA and wear leveling. Because all the other functions just got eliminated and put into the device driver. I'm pretty sure it's DMA as well. So it's 
So, oh, oh that, that could be, yeah. So, so if you do an LSPCI on your bus, what does it show? It shows it. What was, what was the model number on the board? Um, Yeah, well, he's looking that up. Another thing that's worth mentioning for whether it's NVMe or SATA for these SSDs, there's also like just the regular consumer grade and then there's the enterprise class ones. And when you're doing high I.O. type of uh, tasks, you want to go with an enterprise class drive. Or the in-between ones. Or the in-between ones. You don't have to spend Intel update money to do it, hopefully. Doing. But the typical <coughs> consumer grade ones, you'll burn them out very quickly if you're doing 24 7 use of them. <coughs> yes, as we found out. Mm -hmm. Okay, is this going to. Yeah, there we go. Mm -hmm. So there's the model number and a picture of it. And now you see how they managed to get 12 drives into one U, they stack them front to back. Uh, the main downside is it's not technically hot swappable. Um, every time you pull one of the drive trays, you disconnect all three drives in it. So generally speaking, you just power down the server before you do drive maintenance. Were your rebuild times like on that A while. <laughs> um, last time we actually had a drive full, do a full rebuild, which wasn't that long ago. I want to say it finishes within 48 hours. That's not bad. Uh, no, it's, it's not bad. It's not awesome, but it's not terrible. Um, yeah, it's less than a week. It's somewhere between 48 hours. That's when the cache was down. Was no, like when I did one six months ago or a year ago, it was, it was still that. It was between 48. It was, yeah. It was a little bit more than 48. Yeah. yeah, well, it depends on how busy the rest of the array is, of mm -hmm. course. Mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah, this is... The, a, this was an ASUS one. The reason we went with the ASUS version of this instead of, the, say, the Super Micro equivalent or anything like that is because I could get my hands on the ASUS version of it. That simple. It was uh, all the Super Micro ones were system must be sold as complete system by authorized reseller. We were also concerned about rack space, right? The yes. Less was Less.net was concerned about rack space, so they're only willing to guarantee that they could continue giving us one U of rack space at the time. And, well, let's just say that is no longer a valid concern. Um, Less has tons of rack space. So, if, well, not if, when this server gets replaced, I don't think we'll do a one U server again. It's just too difficult to work on. And the premium for a 1U server was not huge, but it was noticeable, measurable. And noisy. Sorry? And noisy. Oh, God, yes. It's not the loudest thing in there, though. It kind of is now. Yeah, it used to be pretty good, well, as 1U servers go. But now, with the, those, are, those fans each run at 20,000 RPM. Yeah, they're loud. Um, so you basically got some jet engines in them. Yeah, sorry, somebody asked. LSPCI. Yeah. yeah, the motherboard in there, by the way, is a P9D-MH. Hmm. Can, can anybody read that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. That's a single processor, right? Yes, yeah. single Xeon processor. Right. The question about LSPCI was how does the NTME show up on that? Where is it? It's in your seat. It's back to the center. It's in your turn on that. Okay. So, so just Bison Electronics Corporation. Yep. E12. Uh, yep. Yep. It's I believe. It's all IO and really the. Yeah. It's, mm -hmm. it's transaction processing almost. <laughs> Maybe we should ask IBM to sponsor us again. <laughs> oh, what was it? That, uh, there's a thing on YouTube, this 18-year-old got himself a Z-series mainframe. From what, eBay? 
Uh, I'm not sure where he got it from. It's in the video, I think. It's, it's cool. Fell off the back of the truck. No, it was, he uh, got it a surplus or something. Somebody was getting rid of it and he stumbled on, or he, people knew about him and said, are you interested? And he said, oh yeah. Yeah. I'm reminded of a fellow here in Winnipeg, or who used to be here in Winnipeg by the name of Sean Walbridge, who once upon a time acquired, legally, uh, both a Sun 10,000 series, which was the, like the, the card-based chassis, which was, yeah, that's like IBM Z series capacity and capability. And then he also got the big SGI one that was the size of a fridge. I can't remember the model of it. And he had both of them running in his data center at the same time. Like, yeah. Hmm? Just no. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't need to heat his house. He never need bigger furnace. Yeah. Um, pretty much. Okay. Any other questions? Thanks, Adam. Yeah.